Hi friends, uh, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Dr. Abhinav Kumar and you're watching Throne in the Deep. So in today's video, I'm just going to walk you through my journey. The journey could be different for you, but a rough idea of my journey of coming to UK as an Indian doctor. So it all started with uh, an ambition to come to UK. And like most of you, I did my MBBS degree in my home country, which is India. And uh, I'll be continuously referencing India, but pretty sure the process will be the same for whichever country you're in. So in my case, I finished my MBBS, did, uh, which includes the internship, of course, of one year. And then I, like during my phase of preparing for a postgraduate exam, that is when I decided that I should do PLAB. So as you can see, the idea of doing PLAB was quite later in my career. But then there, there are some reasons for that. So let's see, uh, my mind was set on doing PLAB. Now what next? Step one was I needed to prove my competency, which can be done by taking exams, which are specially approved by the General Medical Council uh, as a proof of your competency in English. So there were two options uh, to prove that competency in English. One is OET, uh, which stands for Occupational English Test. In India, around my time, it used to cost 30,000 rupees. That's like about in 2000 and uh, never mind. And uh, whereas IELTS was a bit on the lower side. It was about 15,000 rupees. But people say that one is more easier than the other. So even though IELTS is cheaper, it does tend to be perceived as a harder exam to write and uh, people tend to prefer OET more. And But guess, guess who didn't know that at the time? Me. <laughs> so I went and wrote my IELTS. Uh, it, took me, uh, it took me one month of practice. Some people who I talked to, like my seniors, they were able to pull off a good IELTS score with just three days of preparation. But uh, I had joined a couple of Facebook groups by that time. And on Facebook groups, there was a discussion about uh, how people are screwing up their writing as well as uh, like even after multiple attempts of writing IELTS. So the people used to be recommending uh, OAT, but of course I had already paid for my IELTS exam and there was no backing out. And I had a couple of friends who had written IELTS before me. So they warned me about that as well. So uh, in the one month of preparation that I did for IELTS, I took a good chunk of time for practicing writing, roughly about half the time. So about 15 to 20 days of practicing writing part one and writing part two. In writing part one, it's more of an academic summary of a, a graph or let's say some sort of data. And you're supposed to allocate only 20 minute time to write those 150 words to summarize that. And in writing part two, you have 40 minutes to write a proper essay of 250 words, conveying the pros and cons and uh, drawing a good comparison essay uh, on a particular topic that IELTS will provide you. And uh, so there are a couple of videos that I have already put out. You can check them out in the link. Moving ahead, I prepared properly for one month for the IELTS exam. I went, uh, the center wasn't in my state. So I went to the neighboring state to write the exam. And within one week, I got the result for my IELTS and uh, I managed to pass. And the passing criteria is that you need a minimum of seven in all the four sections, which is speaking, reading, writing, and listening. You need a seven in each of them at the minimum, but the total should be an average seven and a half. So the part that's easy is that people can quite sufficiently score the seven and a half overall cutoff. But when, it, when they looked at the individual scores, oftentimes one or especially the writing would be scoring around 6.5. And that does not meet the criteria for the criterion for getting in, uh, like for passing IELTS. I mean, you do always get a score, but GMC criteria for someone who wants to become, who wants to obtain a medical license is that they should have at minimum a seven in all four domains, but the total should be seven and a half. So uh, now, now talking about this, there are different jobs which have different cutoffs. So let's say if you're planning to go into healthcare uh, assistant or some, some other kind of role which does not require you to get the medical license. 
and in those jobs the cutoff can be as low as five in total so if you score an IELTS a uh, total of five out of nine you will be considered competent for the job role but for a medical doctor you need to have seven at minimum in all four and seven and a half when you add up and divide by four so i finally got a good decent score and i was eligible to proceed on to the next step there's also another thing which i would like to highlight is that a minimum of seven and a half when you get that in all four domains makes you eligible for the foundation training program you got the foundation foundation year two doctor and now that can be either under the training program or the trust grade program the training program is part of the national curriculum so the national curriculum requires you to have a cutoff of 7.5 in each of the four domains and uh, an aggregate of i think 7.5 as well whereas a trust grade program for the same role fy2 will only need you to have the gmc license and gmc license requires you to have uh, a seven in all four domains but seven and a half when you aggregate all of them and divide by four so yes <laughs> now with that out of the way i finally got the score of ielts and what you need to focus on in uh, when you get the score is that they will send you a physical report card home and on the physical report card there will be a unique number that you need to enter onto your GMC website um, account. So yeah, talking about that, you make a GMC profile and they sort of allocate you a number at that time as well, which you won't really be paying attention to. So you get that number, which later on becomes your registration number if you go like all the way through. So when you open your GMC account, they will first ask you to prove your English competency. And that can be done by entering this unique code from IELTS report card the physical report card. The data is not available on your email. So the physical report card that you get, you enter that code into the GMC website and then you are approved. I think in the back end, they manage to check whether your scores are what you say they are. And if they meet the criterion, now your next goal is to book a PLAB 1 seat. The PLAB exam is currently, the PLAB 1 exam is currently held four times a year. There was a time around 2017, 16-ish when it was held twice a year. But now that it's held four times a year, you have a lot more options. In India particularly, you have around six centers. So you have a couple of, you have all the four metropolitan centers, as well as you have, you also have Bangalore and Pune. Might change with time, but uh, yeah, you have roughly six centers to choose from. So let's say you... Uh, you go to the list of Lab 1 centers and there's nothing available. What do you do next? You look out for the Facebook groups, you join uh, training Lab 1 preparation group or you join Lab 1 trainees. There are a number of groups on Facebook which you can find. You join them. You also follow the GMC news about when new seats are opening. And together with these two, you can roughly get an idea of when the Lab 1 seats will become available. Now, on the day of, uh, like, let's say they say that the seats will open on the 10th of January. Uh, so this, the booking for the seats of March or maybe next year, whenever they are uh, actually giving you the seats for, the booking will start a certain number of days prior, even months prior for that matter. So let's say you are going for... Uh, uh, you're, you're trying to time your booking like best because you know it's first come first serve so on the day when the booking finally opens you will need you will want the city closest to you rather than having to travel quite far or even sometimes going to a different country for that matter so on the day when you are going to book your seat you will need to have at least two credit cards one is not enough and try and make sure that the cards have approval for you know pound uh, transfer in the sense the international debit cards or international credit cards and uh, the best option of this all would be if you have any relative or any anyone else who can provide you with an actual credit card detail with the cash loaded in it then uh, that will be sure to go ahead so have have that ready and uh, be, be ready uh, on the login screen as well because it's really cutthroat. And I'm really emphasizing it because this will decide whether you get your seat or not, <laughs> the preferred seat or not. You'll definitely get it somewhere. 
if you are going to be dot on time for the seat booking there sometimes there can be a queue for people to log in as well but that shouldn't be an issue you go ahead the moment it's 10 o'clock you start reloading the page because they tend to open at 10 in the morning uh, they go by the gmt time and then you accordingly adapt uh, you convert that time to what it would be for you you sit by the computer let's say it's 10 in the morning you sit by the computer and you reload the page you reload the page and suddenly you are in you've managed to log in quickly follow all the steps to the login uh, to the feed booking page and book a seat now you get 15 minutes to pay for the seat this is a good thing it's not like your seat booking will expire because your transaction failed or something so you do get a good 15 minutes to finalize your booking uh you figured out which card works everything and uh, you you you'll find a long list of like you know dates available because they usually take out multiple dates so if the exam is held in march may august and november they will probably take out dates for let's say may august and november so they take out dates for all of them in one go now based on when you feel like you're going to be ready you book the correct date and once you go ahead and pay for it and everything it's all sorted now you have uh, you'll get an email you might not get it instantly because of the high volume of people booking but if you think your money went through properly and everything then you are going to get uh, an email which says this is the date and so and so for your lab 1 exam this is the center now they won't really announce the exact location for the center because that can still change but yeah the you'll you'll get an email confirming that your booking is done it can take up to few days for for it to go through but at least your uh the website the gmc your account will kind of reflect that you have confirmed your booking now you start preparing for the exam there are a few materials that you can use i have another video on my channel which will talk you more through plab 1 preparation but a uh, good rule of thumb is to have one or maybe two q banks not more than that again the video will guide you through uh, the fine details you you go ahead you start the preparation you can form groups to prepare for the exam as well as you can go all out solo you can con- you can look at the facebook group and you will find more people talking about i need a study partner etc if you think you are you can work well as a team with someone you don't know <laughs> then uh, you can very well team up with them or find somebody from your med school your own class uh, your own batch uh, who might also be booking their exam and uh, team up with them uh, anyway so you you be prepared thoroughly you will get an email closer to your date of the exam about the exact center you need to go there with your passport everywhere passport is your only identity proof accepted nothing else you you go through that and uh, you take your passport you write your lab 1 exam and once you're done you will uh, take it will take a month i guess for the results to come yeah so roughly about 30 days later your results are in and they will let you know how you performed so i in my case i was able to get through quite decently and uh, that hurdle was out of the way now this is where it gets a bit interesting there are there is one other thing that you need to do to speed up your plab 2 journey what that is you need to get all your mbbs degree documents verified what does verification mean the the document can be authentic or inauthentic right so there is this company situated in the us the same as ecfmg which uh, certifies your documents for uh, usmle but they do it after all your exams so epic is uh, a similar service provided by the same company under a different name for some reason and you upload all your online documents to them you mention which med school you went to etc etc and you also make sure that your med school is not on the blacklisted list of global medical schools there's a very small list uh, and there's a very strong chance that your med school will not be a blacklisted one so you go through that uh, epic process you upload all your documents you verify your passport by talking face to face with uh, a notary from the U, uh, from the us they will literally video call you and you need to spend good 2 minutes with them and st- uh, post pose you with a picture of your passport uh, with your on your webcam and uh, they will take a snapshot they will up, they will make you digitally sign the documents etc that that will complete your identity check 
then the epic will chase after uh, the document's authenticity by contacting your med school and uh, some based on which med school you're from it really depends on how proactive they are in replying to it so i studied in manipal the good thing with manipal is that they have quite heavily digitized their system uh, so the day i submitted all my documents and clicked uh, sent to the med school for a check uh, the next day i had my uh, check verified uh, in the sense that my documents were approved by manipal so another thing out of the way you need to get your epic done and that uh, that's a good time to get it done after your plab 1 now you can focus solely on your preparation for plab 2 but <laughs> the follow is a but uh, the challenge with plab 2 is that it's more of an off key so you need to be actually dealing with like real life patients but of course in the exam it's simulated it's simulated to give you a real life patient feel and how do you even go about preparing for a plab 2 exam you can uh, consider joining academies nowadays some academies have gone online you can find their course material on the website on their websites uh, they'll give you access to it after you pay them of course uh, then um, you can also compare some inf information about different academies via plab 2 groups uh, on facebook now is a good time to join plab 2 group so you consider the numerous plab academies that are available as well and you gather all that information and go after a particular academy okay so let's say you find a plab 2 academy if if they have an online material available that's well and good you can start preparing for plab 2 right away but uh, there's only so much you can get out of it because the real experience needs to be had when you probably go to the uh, academy the physical academy which is of course in the uk and currently are sitting back home in india this is where we talk about arranging a visa now here's the thing about the visa you need to have a pretty clear reason as to why you want to come to uk on a visitor visa with regard to your plab 2 exam oftentimes the the immigration officer who will be checking your visa documents will not approve of your document and that can often happen because uh, you have some discrepancies in your document process or like you have your bank balance that uh, having weird chunks of money going in and out which does not match with your salary and things like that you can get flagged if you don't have a job in your home country it can be a, fl a red flag it uh, if you're uh, if you don't have any property back home it can be another red flag to the officer thinking that you might come to UK under the excuse of PLAB2 exam but in reality you are just going to disappear once you enter the country and you've done all this work just to disappear in the country once you actually land there. Yeah, people go to great lengths. Uh, lots of uh, illegal immigrants jumping from the uh, France side of the English Channel and crossing over to the UK and if they're ready to swim the whole length or even take like illegal boats then you're going up a route for PLAB exam can also sometimes fit the criteria for illegal immigrant. <laughs> so you need to have a good evidence to say that you are desperate to go back to your home country and you have no intention of staying there. And for that you need to show strong finances, you need to show spouse back home, uh, if they need to show a job back home, children, and uh, yeah, a good a uh, consistent bank balance is I think where I, you would get started on. I didn't have a spouse back home. I didn't have any children back home. I didn't have a job back home. What I did have was a strong uh, finance uh, like or with a proper bank statement. And it wasn't my own. <laughs> it was my dad's. And yeah, if you have a weird chunk of money getting transferred in and out of your account, it can be, it can raise the suspicion, like I was saying. So in that case, we need to also attach the account details of the the statement, account statement of the other person who made the transfer to you. And uh, you'll also need to justify what the, their relation to you is. It's like if the father, brother, cousin, anyone close by who transferred that money to your account uh, if, uh, and will let you use it rather than just transferred it so you can show a high balance in your account submit the document for the visa and then you give him the money back so basically you're left with nothing again so yeah it, uh, these things are looked for yeah i mean in all this time that's the most common situation i've seen people getting into 
they they say that they are in a particular job and then um, the salary does not tally up the, the sometimes the officers can even look into other documents the company is it actually legitimate and uh, things like that so i had i had a friend who said that he was employed at his parents nursing home and then i think the immigration officers probably contacted the his uh, dad's his dad's job and uh, they didn't and his dad didn't reply they contacted via email and his dad never replied so he got a rejection letter saying that there is there is no proof that the company actually exists the medical center actually exists where he's supposed to be working as per his documents <laughs> so yeah you need to get all that tidbits sorted and uh, it's good if you can gather some documentary proof of the annual housing tax that you are paying for or your parents are paying uh, to show that you have good uh, like property at home to come back to and uh, once all this is done you've applied for the visa and let's say your it, it you can it can take up to 2 months or 1 month depends for your visa standard visitor visa to get approved the you begin the application process through the government or uk website and then you follow it up with going to the vfs center uh on a particular date and submitting the documents uh so all the payment the first bit of payment you do on the british government website around 10000 rupees but that is only if you want it to take up to 60 days for your result to come the other thing you can do is you can go once you are on the vfs website you can pay them an extra bit of money like around 20000 rupees more and uh, you will get your result within one week so that's considered priority so you fill out your the documents on the government.uk website then you are redirected to the vfs website where you go ahead and uh, pay for a speedy service and you end up paying let's say 20000 more now you now you are allowed to book a date for the submission of physical documents uh, i found it really helpful to submit a uh, like you know pay 1000 rupees extra and have my documents scanned by the vfs uh, agent rather than me having to physically like scan and upload it to the to the vfs website which is kind of tricky so i paid that i got all my documents scanned by them after after a few days so um uh, if you paid for the priority service then within 5 days you will expect a response they won't tell you straight away uh, whether you got approved or rejected they will just say your passport is ready for collection and if at the beginning you had submitted for home delivery then it will be couriered to you via blue dot all all that being done once you get the letter um, it will be a sealed envelope you tear it off you find your passport and you find a letter saying yes or no uh and if it's a yes the passport will also have your full page uh, visa stuck on it it will have a 6 month uh, deadline from the day you requested it so i requested my visa about 6 weeks before the exam but they gave it to me 8 weeks before the exam so they gave me a bit extra time i've i've seen cases where people requested 2 week 2 months before and they get it like 1 month before the exam so yeah it can change but most often they do get it around the same time as they requested it i had my exam on 4th april 5th april i had my exam on 4th april uh, 2022 and so i requested that i go to uk Uh, my original idea was to request that i go to uk on 4th of feb but then uh, the place where i was arranging my accommodation some uh, some guy in oldham the place like oldham is a small adjacent town to manchester in fact it's part of the greater manchester area so as you can you can see my room in the other video on tegadums so yeah the landlord who i spoke with he said that he only had the room available from 14th of feb so i requested for a 6 week duration for my visa like you know 6 week before the exam i would like to go to the country but the visa agent gave me an 8 week uh, in advance view entry so i could still go to uk on the 4th of feb and so i had i decided why why not to just go for it <laughs> then i booked my flight tickets and i booked it for 4th I mean in fact I booked it for third evening. So 
or when when I I knew that when I would land in UK, it would be fourth of Feb, and my visa would have activated a few hours before. So I smoothly got entry into the country, and uh, from there I went and stayed in a place for two weeks, then moved to Oldham to that particular location where I stayed for the remaining six weeks until the day of the exam. Now, uh, I I took Aspire uh, Academy. The good thing about Aspire is that sometimes the teachers also travel to different countries like Turkey, Pakistan, Pakistan, not really sure, but India definitely um, because both the teachers that they have are like uh, they have Indian citizenship, I guess, or maybe they have renounced it by this time. But ultimately, they are of uh, Indian origin. Uh, so they, they do come to Turkey, they go, go to many other countries and they also come to India, sometimes Hyderabad, sometimes Delhi. So all this thing about like how to apply for the visa or how to find a landlord to book uh, accommodation with. I discovered all of this when I took their in-person face-to-face class in Delhi. Yes, the teacher from Aspire Academy Manchester had come to Delhi to teach a two-week course. It cost quite a lot. It cost around 700 pounds to attend the teaching in Delhi, uh, but it was worth it because I found a group that I could study with. I, I joined a group of people who had an exam roughly the same time period as mine, and it worked out pretty well for me. Uh, in the sense that when I went to UK, uh, I found all of them again because all of them were Aspire students anyway. And we kind of made a team and we studied together in one person's uh, accommodation place. So. Well, the place where I took uh, residence, it had different rooms but no proper hall to study in, whereas some other places had uh, had smaller rooms or whatever, but they did have a big hall where you can collaborate and study. So my group kind of dominated the scene and we studied there for the next six weeks. Yeah, the first two weeks, of course, I wasn't there. And uh, I just attended the Aspire class again online in the first two weeks that I was in UK. And uh, yeah, the study group would meet every morning and we would revise, uh, study, whatever we have revised the night prior, we would discuss. We would make groups of two, we would make groups of uh, the big groups, two of us would discuss and two others would observe to, to form, like, you know, to give feedback. So of the two of us, one would be the inter- interviewee, another would be the simulator, the patient simulator. So the, the patient would go like, doctor, my tummy. And they're like, I, I can see you are in pain. Would you like some painkillers before we proceed? Or are you, would you, or can you wait for a few minutes until we have, I have assessed you so that I know properly what exactly is the issue. And you get things like this, you know, the more talkative and the more smooth talking you are, the more interpersonal skills you have, the more you will be weighed favorably favorably by the interviewer. In the real exam, you will have the same scenario. There'll be a paid actor who will be pretending to be the patient and you, the doctor, will have a chat with him. And there will be a properly well-qualified consultant sitting somewhere in the room and uh, he will be observing how you perform. So, and then scoring you under different criteria and that he has as a big list. So there'll be things like prescript drug prescription charts where you just gotta read a few points on like the question paper and then take a prescription chart and then start writing your drugs. And uh, you will learn all of this in the academy and also in their online courses. So the good thing about Aspire was that they also had the classes on Zoom. So you can attend the classes many times as you want uh, on Zoom as well once you have paid and joined them. Uh, but it's not really much useful after like once or twice because ultimately it's about practice. So yeah, so some people, after they were done with the classes back in India, they spent the uh, the entire duration until they had to come to UK practicing online with one another another via Zoom. And uh, so when when I finally met them, uh, the brand new books which everybody had received back at the Delhi uh, Academy uh, two-week course, were now fully highlighted with all points written on the side, left and right. But uh, I'm unique. I didn't touch my book until I showed up in uh, Manchester. Uh, Anyway, so after we completed our uh, six weeks of hardcore training, 
the it of it, it of hell <laughs> it, it it of really quite um, stressful every single day regardless whether it's saturday or sunday we are all meeting up in the morning and going for a practice session and uh, like uh, coming back home at 9 pm and then again studying a little bit more for a good 2 uh, 3 hours so that we have we are, we are fresh with some content the next day so every day we would set like 10 chapters target and next day we would try to complete all of it i would never be able to finish all the 10 chapters or 20 chapters 20 topics that you have that somebody else had laid out for me <laughs> for like the group to prepare and come and uh, it was fine i mean we we would take at least 5 minutes to revise for most of us it would be a second or third reading when before we actually got discussing the particular case for me it would be the first reading it was horrible everyone else went outside for a break i would be flipping through the pages so i can be ready for when we resume after the break oh it was hell um mm, yeah but i did make some good friendships out of it yeah quite a good <laughs> that that was the good one um the good phase i guess i'm i'm still friends with all the people in that group now we had one uh, one girl who joined a group uh, brought on by a friend of mine um uh, but i think she didn't quite gel with our group and our style of preparation so she left after a few days while attending the classes i met this one cool guy <laughs> quite cool he he and his friend from med school uh, back in india as well so they they were together just discussing their own thing and we gelled quite well so i invited them to join into our group our, our delhi group so now we had an even bigger group of around 7 to 8 people it's not uncommon to find groups of that size they do tend to split up while preparing and then again merge to discuss and give feedback so it's quite interesting how it all worked out and all of us have now graduated plab 2 got an rgmc registration and have entered into the jobs so the, <laughs> Yeah, it's quite nice. Oh god, I can't think of I got to stop blushing about <laughs> my my plab to group. I'm really proud of each one of us and the work we have put in. Except for one guy. Shouldn't lie that much. He used to lie a lot. Anyway, he used to entertain us a lot as well. But uh all said and done, we we all passed our plab. We went for the plab exam in the morning or the afternoon session. Took the exam. and after we are all done with the exam we headed our separate ways some of us stayed in the country a little longer and why and what did we do during that time uh much before the exam itself we had requested different consultants the senior the proper degree holding doctors here are called consultants so we uh, we talked to the we had emailed different consultants in different hospitals and they approved a couple of us like here and there randomly for doing a clinical attachment yeah so that is what we all stayed behind for um we try to time our clinical attachment to begin soon after we are done with the plab 2 exam uh so the one month that it takes for the plab exam to the result that one month in middle uh is the perfect time to do a month long clinical attachment you can contact two consultants and do a 14 day attachment under one consultant in one department and 14 day attachment under another consultant in another department and yeah and once you get build a rapport with them you can also ask them for clinical supervisor recommendation later which will be forwarded to the gmc or to your next job that you actually apply and sometimes the consultant may offer a job to you themselves that this job is coming up please contact my secretary <laughs> and that can happen my consultant did offer me a job opportunity right off uh, right out of the box uh, within a week of me having worked with him but the problem was that the secretary needed another year of experience like an f3 level of experience uh, so f3 is anything after f2 <laughs> yeah so she needed f3 which i didn't have i had already completed my f1 that's it so i couldn't take that job then i looked around applied for other vacancies in my hospital I asked other doctors and like other junior doctors and they gave me different uh, secretary numbers to call especially my very close friend uh, who had some who was working in the in the current hospital that I'm in uh, she provided me with uh, the JDA numbers the JDAs are the junior doctor administrators they are the secretaries that handle the staffing for different departments as well as 
any other onboarding and offboarding requirements that the that the doctor might have. They are they are separate from the HR team. Uh, HR is just more general paperwork and billing and like pay, salary, etc. So JDA have a well defined range. They are the people who are off like you know uh, who will be your day to day staff to talk to in terms of your leaves and etc. Leaves and rota and etc. So they also so I talked to a couple of JDAs, junior doctor administrators, and uh, got myself a few interviews. And uh, I did well in one interview and uh, got the job. And so I started my training in, uh, I mean, and then I got a job letter and everything for me to start at a particular date. Now that being out of the way, so, okay, I'm, we are going ahead of ourselves. Let's come back to the point where I have clini- completed my clinical attachment. So after I was done with clinical attachment, I got the GMC result that I had passed PLAB2. <laughs> yes. And after I was through with PLAB2, I needed to submit a couple of documents to them about uh, what work I have done in the past one year or two years since the time of graduation. Uh, So I sat down and typed everything, uh, which departments I had rotated in, what are the work I did back home. I I, I sat empty for like eight months preparing for USMLE, preparing for NEAT PG and doing everything else under the sun, preparing for PLAB exam. I, I, I wrote anything and it kind of worked. Uh, you're not, what this says, you're not supposed to show a gap of more than 28 days while, while describing what you did since the time of your graduation. The, the, so even if you did nothing for two months, you need to mention those two months and say you did not do anything like, or like you have studied for an exam. You cannot say Jan, January, I did this, February, I did this, April, I did this. So you cannot ju- go down to April. You need to mention what you did in the entire of March. Like, if you get it. So even if you write nothing in March, but you need to mention a section saying, March, nothing done. <laughs> Let's say, March, uh, prepared for exam. Uh, prepared for the English test or anything. Uh, enjoyed a nice holiday, even for that matter. So yeah, go all out descriptive. Then they will follow up on all the things that, uh, that require a verification like any hospital work that you did, etc. So that, that, that is a bit of a work. Um, you need to try to be honest with what you did. So I had uh, like whatever hospital work you did, you will, they, they will, uh, the GMC will email them and ask that whether you really worked under them. And uh, sometimes you might need to submit a form. It's called a Gen 1 form. So you need to send the form over to the hospital. They will sign it and send it back to you and then you send it to GMC. Uh, Now then GMC will ask the hospital whether it was really them who signed that Gen 1 form. And uh, once they say yes, they will have, uh, the GMC will authenticate that Gen 1 form. And they go, they do it for every single job that you've applied. Sometimes it can become a problem that you worked in one state, but uh, your registration was from a different state. Let's say you were Delhi registered and you worked in uh, Gurgaon which is in Haryana. So now, Gurgaon is in Haryana? Yeah, it is. Oh, I've, I've been out of the country for far too long. So let, let's let see. Uh, so when that happens, you need to show proof that you are eligible to work in a different uh, state, even if you have a registration in, a different, in another state. So uh, I didn't have to do it, but there are proper channels for doing this. And uh, it's quite a well-known issue and people have resolved it quite easily. You can always ask on the Facebook group how to go about it. GMC, they even check your registration. They sent an email in my case to the Delhi Medical Council and to Karnataka Medical Council. Because Karnataka Medical Council, I was registered into straight out of Manipal. And then after a while, I got an NOC from Karnataka and and registered myself in Delhi. So they sent an email to both of them. And then uh, I needed to let them know that they need to reply to that email saying that my registration is authentic. Otherwise, the, uh, the Karnataka Medical Council would not have a clue what is going on. So they were quite proactive. Delhi is quite rapid. Uh, by the time the first phone call I did, they said that they had already done it. But uh, they had already replied to GMC. But sometimes it's good to chase up. And uh, same for Karnataka. Karnataka needed a little more work. But eventually I got approved. Uh, they, both of them replied to GMC that yes, I did have registration under them at specific times. 
so all, all that being done i was finally i finally got my gmc registration and once i had my gmc registration then my interview started so it was a coincidence that my interview started afterwards and every single time the first question was do you have a gmc registration with a license to practice so yeah uh i was like yeah fair if i do and then uh, there would be a bit of an ethical section and a bit of and a clinical scenario usually an emergency the since we were, we are going to be the first point of contact for a patient with emergency so in medicine i got pulmonary embolism in emergency medicine i got patient with a long life and causes for why they might have fainted as well as asthma treatment and how high you can escalate like what are the further man management modalities like magnesium etc that you can go up to while managing asthma and then an ethical section sometimes about what what will you do if your if your friend uh, nfy2 can come in drunk to the hospital and what how will you escalate how will you talk to them etc so that was my question in uh, hepato biliary department sometimes you really need to chief them up a lot for my uh, ed interview i emailed the the secretary and then i got no reply from the uh, from the jda the secretary and uh, one one month later i randomly got an email we are hiring for an fy2 in ed are you ready uh, are you still looking for a job i said yes and uh, she booked an interview date for me for yeah, for medicine i needed to talk to the consultant and then i had to talk to the jda uh, and then i told him that i had discussed with the consultant that since the job interview is coming up uh, i will send you the cv and if it looks good enough can you please include me in the interview list as well done for hepato biliary i went through a list of phone numbers that uh, of all the secretaries of different uh, you know departments and uh, give, just started ringing them do you have any vacancy do you have any vacancy uh, then one of them hepato biliary said they did have vacancy so she emailed me i got in touch with her and uh, i sent all my details my cv everything i forwarded to them your cv should include a picture your current uk address your phone number your email id your um, your address location let's say like a physical address if you can provide it uh, all of this like probably you properly uk based it'll be helpful and also your uk phone number for that matter <laughs> it really speeds up the process of uh, going through your document for them uh, all the all this being done it took me a lot of communication with hpb to finally get a interview secured the the secretary were not very like you know responsive to the phone calls every single day you wake up at 8 o'clock and make like five five rings to this department five rings to that department i tried other hospitals like random connections uh like hi i i got a call from i i told i spoke to this person earlier and they said you might have vacancy and things like that so that's one way to do it another one is uh, yeah all this aside uh, the other method is track jobs track jobs is the government's official portal for applying for jobs in uh, under different hospitals and lots of trust grade jobs are there that means you are hired by the trust and not by the national training program so under the trust grade uh, uh, job requirements the trust that means nhf trust in wales it's called health board the hospitals in england will have nhf trust as their uh, suffix so let's take for example university hospitals of leicester nhs trust now that's the full name of the hospital and not just a uh, university hospitals of leicester your first goal should be to secure a job so the job that you are applying for let's say an fy2 job there will be different names for the same job with because they have a slight different roles between them so it can be called a trust grade foundation year 2 job which as the name suggests is not the part of foundation training program by the government it is just the trust which has this post for you so you are being employed by the trust and not by the central government which is then rotating you among different trusts so yeah uh so that 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 is one uh, name another could be something like a junior clinical fellow where you also have a bit of teaching roles and uh, in terms of organizing different events uh for juniors working with the senior doctors in facilitating more presentations and things like that so 
research assistant is not a very common post uh, but you can find some of them as well and then you can also look into jobs which are part time or full time uk government has a small criterion like a clause which says that you need to earn a minimum of 20 something thousand pounds in a year to be eligible to even get a tier 2 visa to come and work in the country so if you take a part time job or any other form like you know 60% work instead of the full 100% or row of rota things like that you also got to look out for whether it meets the criterion by the home office of uk to to be eligible for a tier 2 visa all these minor things considered you figure you fill out the track track jobs form just go left and right fill out any a department a uh, job that you can find try getting a couple of references that will help and especially like the ones which you might have acquired during your time in uh, clinical attachment speaking a little bit more about clinical attachment my was pretty smooth it depends really on the consultant and the hospital that that is um, that is taking you on as a clinical attache some of them are pretty easy going and you can begin at your own leisure and some of them are like making you pay others want you to have a police clearance certificate uh, from your home country to establish that you are a, like a legitimate person with no criminal background and things like that so depending uh, so i think it's the safest to have as many documents ready as possible because once the clinical attachment begins you'll have to <laughs> do a lot of paperwork as well So anyway, coming back to the job avenue. You apply for a lot of jobs, you get shortlisted, uh, you go for the interviews and uh, if you have done well in the interview, you will get an email uh, later on a couple of days later saying that you have been accepted for the job and then they will send you a conditional letter of employment. It's conditional because they still need to verify all your documents uh, to make sure that you are legit what you are saying you are. once that condition is fulfilled then all you need to do is sign it and send it back to them by email most of the times even the interviews are online uh so when once you're through with that then you will get a proper like job secured and then the trust itself will apply for your certificate of sponsorship you need to kind of chase up with the hr at times and even your jda let's see once the job is approved regarding making sure that the certificate of sponsorship work is ongoing the thing with the cos cos uh, certificate of sponsorship if that only only some jobs can potentially give you a sponsorship and literally any hospital is eligible to provide you with one and of course they need to pay to the home office so that uh, you can be approved for the process but they handle all of it and uh, okay so once you get your certificate of sponsorship approved hr will send you um, a proper document two or three pages long and where you what you need to pay special attention to is whether your maintenance has been included or not so in my case i had my maintenance as y so the good thing about being maintenance being y that means the hospital is going to sponsor your maintenance now why is this important uh, it's because um the home office wants to know how you will fund yourself in the first month of your job when you do not have your first salary because salary comes at the end of the month around 27th ish uh, of the month so most of the times the trust will write a yes on the sponsorship letter but occasionally you might get a no in which case you also need to attach your bank statement and your proof of funds with your visa application for the tier 2 visa when you submit to the home office to show that yes you can very well live off your own savings until you get a first salary and as in my case the, it was already ticked a yes so uh, there was one less thing to wo- worry about my previous police clearance certificate had expired by this time so i went and made another one because now that you are applying for a tier 2 visa which allows you to stay for more than 6 months in uh, uk you also need to show proof of your criminal record back in uh, in your home country so uh, at least if the cops tell you that you are all clear that's a good sign so it's like all over again you fill out form on the uk government website you mention your cos number that code you enter in there and then um, all the details come up which hospital is sponsoring you and so and so 
and uh, you book an appointment in VFS and just go for it. I went with as many documents as I could. I even went with a GMC registration letter, which doesn't seem to be necessary because the trust should have done their homework. And I guess the home office will go with that. But anyway, you can attach your expired IELTS. It doesn't hurt uh, because you have already done your PLAB. So it's not really much importance anymore. Uh, if the IELTS is only required by the GMC to make sure that you are competent in English when you are appearing for your PLAB 2. And uh, okay, yeah, so that's the big catch. You're within two years of your of you passing IELTS, you should be through with PLAB part one and PLAB part two, or you will need to reappear for the IELTS exam. Two years was not a very long time back in COVID days because the exams were so far apart and a couple of exams were canceled. Uh, luckily, I didn't happen to have my exam canceled, but that did mean I, ha I would have to wait longer to write my exam. So eventually, uh, all said and done, I got my visa and I booked my flight to come to UK. And uh, of course, during this entire process, I was continuously in touch with the HR and my JDA to know that this is where I am at in my application process to come to UK. Because, you know, one of the big rules of the JDAs is to manage your to manage adequate medical staffing in the department. And once I managed to get it all done, I let them know when I could be coming to the country. They gave me a date from which I should begin. They They made a bundle of like, uh, like investiture documents and introduction documents, your shadow period, etc. Yeah, and always try to ask for a shadow period because when you come new to the country, you don't want to straight away be given rules to do, you know. In the first month or so, you should have a period of where you are supernumerary. That means you are above the required number of medical staff. Um, you do not come in the required number of medical staff needed to run the department. So let's say there are seven junior doctors needed to run the run an emergency department on any particular day. Then uh, you would be the eighth person and your presence or absence wouldn't make a difference to the department's functioning. So yeah, you turn up, you gain your experience, you have your supervisor meeting yeah, that, that, that's another whole new ball game, which I won't go into at the moment. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> you are finally in the system. One thing is, when you read about your salary being the base salary, in my case, uh, for a foundation year two doctor, the base salary was about 34,000 and 12 pounds. That is only if you work weekdays, no weekends, no nights and just eight to fives. If you did that for the whole year, then you would walk away with 34,012 pounds before taxes. But in uh, real life, you would also need to do evenings, nights, weekends, weekend nights. And so they are all built differently. So the final income that you make will be substantially higher than the base salary. And in my case, what's happened is my final income was high enough so that after the tax deduction, which can be quite high, <laughs> uh, I, I walked away with uh, a salary which is equal to what my base salary was. So roughly around 34K after taxes. Uh, but if you just focus on the base salary alone, then if you do subtract taxes from it, then I should have been only walking away with like 24 or 25K, but due to all nights and everything else, it's sitting at around 34K. Of course, there are ways to boost your income with uh, doing locums. Uh, of course, you won't be taking the locums up in the first month or two right away. But then uh, with time, you will figure out the rest. Of course, you will need to arrange for your accommodation and all the fine bits. The, uh, a Forex card would be helpful. It, it would also benefit you if you have uh, a proof of being employed by a particular hospital. Then you can use that proof of employment to open a bank account Sometimes you might need to wait for your BRP and uh, bi BRP is your biometric residence permit. It is a credit card sized card with your unique details which allow you to stay in the country. Your visa that they stick in your passport will expire after three months. And following that, you will need to, anytime you pass the border, you will need to show your BRP and your passport because they are kind of interlinked. And uh, yeah, so even if the visa is expired, on your passport, as long as you've got the BRP, you can be safely in the country.
if I once you get the BRP, it makes a lot of things easy. Like things like opening a bank account with Halifax. Try to open a bank account as soon as you can get here because that will help with building the credit score. And eventually, if you're planning to buy a house uh, years down the line, the faster you get the credit score started, the better for you. So this was my comprehensive PLAB journey. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Now I think we are going ahead of ourselves in this topic. And uh, let me know your thoughts. If you have any other questions, you can always drop them down in the comments. Uh, my name is Abhinav Kumar and you are watching Thrown in the Deep. So if you'd like to know about my journey to UK in terms of what I did for IELTS, what I did for PLAB, here is a quick playlist that you can check out where you can watch a video of your liking to get to know even more about how you can successfully come into the UK as a doctor. So I will see you in the playlist. Watch one.